Hello everyone and welcome to the Monday evening of Pint of Science here at the University of Southampton, which may look an awful lot like my study. I'm John Coxon, I'm your host for the evening. I'll be guiding you through the wild world of science and the equally wild world of pints. And for my pint, I have this most excellent mango beer called Bring Me Sunshine which is made with mango puree and doesn't taste at all of beer, which is quite nice. Let me know what you're drinking in the comments and I'll shout out any interesting ones uh, in the breaks. Oh, that's the stuff. Right, so we have a packed show for you today. So let's dive in. Um, we're going to be starting with Dr. Christine Evers who is going to be talking to robots in her presentation. So any robots in the audience, please commence getting excited. Any robots in the house? I can't hear anything because it's a YouTube show. But if I was in a pub, I'd definitely be able to hear if there are any robots. And I'd be running away, perhaps. Um, Dr. Christine Evers is a lecturer in the School of Electronics and Computer Science at the University of Southampton, and her research focuses on machine learning. She's the cohort lead for the Center for Doctoral Training in Machine Intelligence for Electronic Devices and Systems, and the Doctoral Training Network and Defense Sector lead for the UKRI Trustworthy Autonomous Systems Hub, which is all very good. So she is well placed to talk to us about talking with robots. And uh, let's hear from her now. Take it away, Christy. Hi, John. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for the really kind introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, right. Your question might be, why do I want to talk to robots? Uh, what's this all about? Um, well, the reason you want to talk to robots and why we require robots to actually be aware of what is going on in their acoustic environments is that sound is used in nature to communicate to detect salient events, to track, but also to evade threats, uh, to self-localize and to navigate. So there's a multitude of different aspects that we actually do with sounds. So clearly given how important sound is in nature, the ability to listen uh, is a fundamental prerequisite for artificial intelligence. Intuitively, as humans, we actually expect a machine to be able to listen, to make sense of sounds in the environment, and to make decisions based on the sounds that we can hear. Um, the ability for AI technologies to reason about sounds is particularly crucial for applications that involve human-machine interaction. So, for example, when uh, robots and humans are trying to interact and work together as part of a team. Um, however, if you've ever used sound-driven technology in the wild, you may have experienced some challenges, and specifically in everyday environments, for example, in restaurants, in our homes, or in airports, a robot's microphones actually pick up the signals from multiple competing sound sources that are active simultaneously. So this interference from competing speakers or sound events like a boiling kettle, background music, and construction noise uh, make it extremely difficult for machines to actually make sense of life and sound. Um, in contrast to audio signals, cameras actually provide us with very rich representations of visual scenes. So we can actually segment uh, these images into different layers, subjects, and objects that are located within the image. However, the sounds of each acoustic source within a scene are actually compressed into a single waveform at each microphone that is installed on board of a robotic system. And as a consequence, what the robot perceives is a complicated and entangled mixture of sound events. So the robot now requires algorithms that enable it to detect, localize, and track active sound sources to separate these sources and then to focus on sound events that are of interest whilst suppressing anything that is not really relevant. So the question really now is, what information can the robot use in order to make sense of the surrounding acoustic environment? Uh, now, first of all, each sound source effectively has its own acoustic fingerprint. Uh, sound is produced when an object vibrates, for example, to produce speech, human talkers push air from the lungs through the vocal tract. This causes the vocal tracts to vibrate and the resulting sound waves pro propagate outward through the mouth and nasal tract. 
Um, the resulting sound waves at the speaker's lips resemble in its most simple form a sinusoidal waveform. And this waveform is emitted from the mouth of the talker, propagating through the room to reach the microphones or the artificial ears of a robotic listener. Now, depending on the sound that the source is actually making, the frequency of the sound wave, so the number of cycles of the sinusoid per second, changes over time. And to reveal such variations, we can use mathematical transformations such as the Fourier transform uh, that allow us to plot the sound energy against frequency and time. And such a visualization is called a spectrogram and is provided here on the right hand side of the slide. Uh, now, in practice, audio signals are not pure tones, so they're not perfect sine waves in practice in general. Um, Rather, sounds are actually typically composed of, of a fundamental tone at the frequency of vibration and then a series of higher frequencies that are called harmonics. And these harmonics repeat at integer multiples of the fundamental frequency. Now, for human speakers, uh, the fundamental frequency actually corresponds to the pitch of our voice. So this is quite a distinctive feature that each of us has uniquely associated with them or that we associate with another speaker. Uh, and also the sounds that we produced are uh, determined by acoustic features that are unique to each individual speaker, such as the timbre, the rhythm and the loudness of our voice. So naturally, these characteristic acoustic fingerprints vary between different speakers, but they also vary between different types of sound events. So whilst I plotted here a spectrogram of a human speaker, on this slide, uh, what you can see is the spectrogram of a completely different sound event, namely the siren of an ambulance. Um, so since each source has its own acoustic fingerprint, as computer scientists and engineers, we can now design algorithms that exploit these fingerprints in order to classify and identify sound events. Now, in addition to the acoustic fingerprint of each sound source, we can also take advantage of spatial cues about the locations of uh, sources relative to the robot. So for a healthy human listener, we typically have two microphones in the form of our ears. Uh, of course, inspired by human listening, we could actually equip our robot with two mics as well. Uh, however, robots actually allow us to go one step further, and that's because robotic platforms enable us to design autonomous systems that excel human hearing by installing whole arrays of multiple microphones where we have mics installed in the head, the limbs, and the body of the robot. Now, as the sound wave of a source is propagating through the environment, it reaches each of the robot's microphones, wherever they're located, with a small delay somewhere in the region of a few milliseconds, depending on the distance between the microphones. In addition, uh, due to scattering of sound of surrounding objects and the robot's body itself, uh, the sound energy at each microphone actually varies ever so slightly. So what we can now do is to design algorithms that exploit these delays and differences in the signals between microphones in order to localize and track the positions of sound sources, for example, human speakers relative to the robot. And of course, we can use prior information, for example, from visual signals uh, in order to suppress sounds uh, from directions where we know that there are objects that are not particularly interesting. For example, if we know that the cattle is standing behind us, we don't particularly want to listen in that direction anyway, so we might as well just remove that information from the signals. Now, how can, um, how can we bring this uh, information together to actually equip a robot with the ability to hear? So we know that there are acoustic fingerprints and we know that there's spatial information about the geometry in the environment between sources and the robot, uh, but what can we do with this now? Well, based on our knowledge of the ways in which humans perceive sounds, uh, my research develops mathematical models that mimic and translate the human hearing process to robotic systems. And specifically, we develop machine learning algorithms that learn and exploit patterns that are actually exhibited in audio data. So basically, these algorithms learn that there's a particular um, characteristic that most birds will sound like or that most human speakers will sound like or that an appliance might sound like. And based on these patterns, we can then learn to disentangle this very complicated uh, mixture of signals that arrive at the uh, microphones of a robot. 
Um, our algorithms specifically exploit acoustic fingerprints of sound events in order to separate salient sound sources of interest from noise sources, such as a boiling kettle. Uh, and we use spatial cues about the locations of sources uh, in order to equip the robot with the ability to focus and acoustically zoom into sources of interest in order to switch attention in realistic everyday environments, just like humans do. Now, naturally, in order to actually create an artificial general intelligence, the ultimate goal would be to fuse the information that we infer, uh, that we infer from sounds with other modalities that are available on the robotic system, for example, with vision or with touch. Uh, that said, uh, the ability to make sense of life and sound has significant advantages in its own right, and particularly sound excels in scenarios where we require perception that reaches beyond the direct line of sight of visual and optical senses, or in scenarios where human end users actually feel that cameras infringe on their privacy. So as such, our research in the space of machine listening and robot audition has the potential to disrupt and transform a whole host of industries. For example, we could use sound to detect faults in smart prosthetics. Machine listening also has the potential to benefit the market for autonomous vehicles where sound recognition could enable the early detection of sound events outside of the field of view of cameras, such as emergency vehicles. Uh, the ability to make sense of sound impacts on ecology, where microphones are used for environmental uh, monitoring. And we could use sound for search and rescue in hazardous environments where robots actually need to localize and recover people that are covered in building rubble. And of course, also sound directly impacts on uh, technologies for virtual reality, where acoustic scene understanding could enable us to process and render new immersive environments for example, to allow us to virtually visit our family and friends in their home environments. Well, thank you very much for your attention, and I would be delighted to take any of your questions during the Q&A. Thank you very much, Christine. That was amazing. Um, we'll be doing the Q&A at the end of the video, probably at about 10 minutes uh, to nine. So do keep the questions rolling in. I see a couple already um, and Christine will be around to answer those at the end. Um, but thank you again very much, Christine. Thank you. We have some reports of what people are drinking in the chat. Um, the Mima is drinking knowledge and learning, which is pretty excellent. I wish I could do that. It made my job a whole bunch easier. Uh, so thank you very much for writing in the Mima. Um, and um, so Eliehu, sorry if I've pronounced that incorrectly, uh, says that they're drinking orange juice, uh, which is an excellent uh, shout. Mine looks like orange juice, uh, but is, is definitely not. Um, and Miles says that they are drinking, uh, no, says that what I'm drinking doesn't count as beer. Now, I have a can that begs to differ, and I am John Coxon, all one word on Untapped. I'll post it in the YouTube chat, and you can check out that it is definitely a real beer. Um, okay, thank you very much, people. Um, do be tweeting. Uh, we're at Pint of Science on Twitter or hashtag Pint21. Um, I've been tweeting uh, under those hashtags, uh, so I'm very excited tonight. And I'm going to kick it over to the next speaker, um, who is Andreas Matchenas who is from Estonia and will be talking to us about the building blocks of the electronic systems in his home country. Um, he'll be using some fact-driven stories and use cases of what's worked so far. Uh, Andreas is a current student of mathematics at the University of Southampton and is helping building official government services for COVID-19 responses, contributing to tech startups and building a software company called Stardust that's proposing better ways to handle people's personal data online. So we're in good hands with him and take it away, Andreas. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, John. So every government offers services uh, to its citizens. Like, just like Instagram gives you the ability to share photos with your friends and WhatsApp allows you to send messages and make calls. However, there's one crucial difference. Governments usually don't put a lot of emphasis on user experience, at least in the big picture. And this is where my home country, Estonia, stands out. And I'd like to show you today why, how, and what is different. First up, voting. Um, this is how voting looks like in the UK. Usually there's a line at the polling station where you have to wait your turn. 
Um, but even if there is no cube, you have to be present at some physical location. So whereas for me, as an Estonian, voting takes only a couple of minutes, and I can do it while traveling in the USA, or if I'm hanging out with my friends in Brazil, or if I enjoy my wonderful rooftop view in Paris. Uh, for anyone who's worried, the photos are illustrative. Um, in the last vote in Estonia, almost half of the votes came through I voting, um, and the location of Estonians covered the whole globe. Next up, tax returns. Um, I came across this video on YouTube. It's uh, 25 minutes long and has a horrifying thumbnail. Um, in UK, you, you can do your tax returns by filling a form on the website, which granted is a lot better than in USA, where you oftentimes need to hire a separate tax declaration lawyer. Um, I read in the news how the US, uh, United States IRS payment portal crashed as people rushed their declarations in last minute. Now, in Estonia, if it ever crashes, it is on the first minute after the declaration site opens up because people are excited to do their tax returns because it literally takes three clicks. And I'm not over-exaggerating at all. Like this year, I timed myself and it took me exactly 40 seconds. So what makes all this possible? The key is in the ID card. Um, that's mine right here. Uh, besides being a valid uh, travel document in the EU and identification document, it also has some neat uh, extra features. I've outlined in red what is my personal ID code um, that I was given at birth. Uh, but I've blurred out my signature because I've signed documents outside Estonia with it, but I could leave it unblurred. The beauty of it is that nothing you can see here is more confidential than my name. Um, I, do, I don't necessarily tell everyone my name, but you cannot sabotage me if you do know my name. And the personal ID code is like my digital name. And on the other side of the ID card, there's a chip that confirms it's really me. I can use it to legally sign documents. Uh, and with this, I can access every one of the almost 3,000 e-services there are. Either it's provided by the public sector, um, like e-health, e um, tax, car registration, driving license, um, or the private sector, like banks, telecom, even shop discounts can be attributed to the ID card. And all this is possible thanks to the once only principle, um, which we call when authorities are required to use the existing data about the person. Uh, and in the case when there is no data, um, they will have to get the data in a single transaction. So that means as a person, you will never enter the same type of data more than once. And the infrastructure behind it is called XROAD. Um, it's a name for the system that connects all the databases together. Um, companies or state organizations can query any type of data about the person, granted that they have a real reason um, to access the data and they have the specific consent um, from the person. Uh, this process is possible you know, thanks to this layout that you can see here. Um, so, you can see private and public sector are both part of this. It's decentralized and uh, it's called a distributed data exchange layer. Um, every piece of personal data is kept at the group who collected that piece of data first. So the view you can see here is kind of like this more um, tangible or understandable version. Um, this is what politicians show and, and you can see in PR work. But um, this is what it actually looks like. Um, here's all the connections. And you can you can do a lot of uh, you can do a lot of cool things when your whole country is connected up like that. But uh, more on this a bit later. So I bet most of you have heard about the craze Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are going through right now. And the underlying technology blockchain is promising to change the way we send money, arrange contracts, and define ownership of digital goods. So in Estonia, actually started playing around with blockchain-like technology in 2008. And actually, before the Bitcoin white paper coined the term blockchain, so we called it hash-linked timestamping uh, back then. And later, it came into official use to protect national data, e-services, smart devices, both in the public and private sector, by preventing data tampering so all interactions would be traceable. In other words, uh, history cannot be rewritten by anybody, and the authenticity of the electronic data can be mathematically proven. So Estonia's uh, blockchain technology has been proven to work and is today even used by the, uh, by the NATO and US Department of Defense. So something that you've heard me say uh, multiple times already is that uh, both the private and public sector are working together in this. So what's the big deal? It's, important, it's, it's an important piece of information because many countries have identification 
codes and numbers. I mean, the concept is not really anything new, but um, they are usually private and used only in one or limited number of departments. Like US has the social security number, the UK has national insurance number, and most countries have some identification number for some part of the public or the private sector. So fun fact, around a third of social security number leaks in the US are from family members peeking over the person's, person's, uh, person's shoulder. So having, having the number private is not really secure. Um, there has to be some uh, public number with authentication, kind of like public and private key relationship. And in Estonia, uh, we do authentication with the ID card or with our personal mobile phones that are verified. And the cool part is that it's open source and everybody can benefit from this. And I mean, everybody. Last October, I was at a hackathon where um, the winning team built a service to officially sign tweets with your uh, Estonian electronic ID. So any other person could verify this tweet you sent that it was indeed by you. Um, and they built that in, in under 48 hours. Like building e-services doesn't take years or months. It could, but you know, it can take only hours. Um, and the cooperation between the public and private sector it, what, it is what makes it even more appealing for citizens to use their um, uh, digital identity. And one thing that can help us uh, make better e-services is artificial intelligence. So AI is the key economic driver for the next 20 years of economic growth. AI will play an ever increasing role as the best services is when everything's automatic when there's no user interface at all, no visual service at all. Uh, an example is that when a woman gives birth, the kid is registered, the baby gets a digital name, so the ID code. Um, and in Estonia, the mother also gets a maternity subsidy um, assigned to her based on uh, her past salary. So these are, not, these are not separate steps to be taken. All this has to be automatic and can only uh, be that if you can query the population registry, the health registry, and the bank details in this example. So both public and private sector. So Estonia came up with this Krat vision. So Krat by itself is this mythological creature that's been made up of stuff you can find lying around the farm. And then you kind of build it and it comes alive and does uh, different chores for you, like mows the lawn. Here's a car cartoonified illustration of, of the creature. Anyways, Krat is the vision of AI services such that a citizen would spend less time interacting with e-services. In other words, more connected services actually means less services. Um, and the goal for 2020 was, the, was to have the first 50 of such services up and running. And today I counted 52 live and working AI services um, and 18 more in, in development currently. So with all this interconnectedness might come one fear. Is it possible to do this without getting the big brother? Um, and Estonia thinks the answer is yes. Uh, and we think the, the, the key lies in transparency. I can see every single query that is done about my data and nobody besides me can aggregate all the data about me into one place. To illustrate, here you can see all the queries done about me from the population registry. So the first is my login to the port portal right before I took the screenshot. The second is my bus ticket because I can get free rides if I'm under a certain age. There's insurance fund, uh, statistics and so on and so on. If I see something I don't recognize, I can follow up and ask, why did this person or organization query my data? And they will be held accountable. So president of Estonia recently said in a CNBC interview that GDPR, the general data protection um, regulation in Europe, is child's play next to the data protection regulation in Estonia. For example, using your privileges due to your occupation to query people's data without their consent or explicit need, you can get fired. Or if this anyhow is shared with a third party, then you know it's time to start packing because you're going to jail. We, we had a member of the Estonian police jailed because she queried her boyfriend. So it's absolutely no joke. One of the cornerstones of a digital society is that people own their data wherever it's stored. And they must have an overview and control over that data. But Estonia is a small country, 1.3 million people. It's like Birmingham if you include nearby towns. Our neighbors, we have um, Finland to the north, Sweden, uh, Latvia, the one who shall not be named um, to the east. Uh, although we're part of EU and, and NATO, the question remains, what if something happens in Estonia physically, a natural disaster, a war? It would be like squashing a fly. Um, so as you saw with voting, for example, paperless society also means location independent society. 
And this has given us an opportunity to create data embassies to ensure the digital continuity of Estonia as a state, even if the worst would come. So the first data embassy was opened in Luxembourg in 2017, and it's essentially a highly secure data center outside home territory. It currently holds data sets that are uh, updated regular, uh, regularly. But the plan is to also um, ha uh, upload services there, expanding the availability globally. I mean, at this point, Estonia reminds me more of Google or Netflix um, that wants to ensure good service globally, because inevitably, this is where society is moving. Country borders are becoming less and less of a determining factor. So you might wonder, like, is this super expensive? In relative terms, no, it's about 1% of the entire state budget to upkeep the infrastructure. Of course, it's a long process that tends, um, you know, it's a long process to build and upkeep it. And Estonia has this no legacy rule, meaning that no system in the government can be older than 13 years. Oftentimes, technologies change even faster than that, but this is just to ensure the agility. And it avoids situations like the US saw last year where people were getting unemployed so fast, they crashed the registry system. And IBM had to train programmers a 60-year-old uh, programming language, COBOL, to, to stabilize the systems. And by the way, systems breaking aren't what I'm emphasizing here. Like Estonia has had a number of faults and endured heavy cyber attacks uh, that have taken down websites and systems. But the point is that up-to-date systems are more secure and easier to handle. So it's definitely a necessity, even if it only means that it's written in a widely accepted programming language. And there are many benefits to the country uh, from a system like that. Lots of time and human capital is saved. For example, only considering um, signing documents digitally saves around 2% uh, of GDP every year. Um, here's one more mess of a graph. Um, so Estonia asks companies whether they're okay with declaring all the transactions they do to solve VAT fraud issues. And um, companies said yes to the transparency. And this is, for example, what the Estonian gas industry looks like. Um, you can see there are um, key companies who operate with uh, a lot of smaller companies. And this visual gave overview, and uh, the graph gave enough actionable insight that led to a 2% increase in the national budget. And for people, you know, people gain uh, convenience. They don't lose control over their data. They get so much extra value. Would it be in e-prescriptions, di digital signature, bus tickets, voting, notary service, or even a convenient way to register a business quickly? For anyone who's curious, um, there's two cool things um, that you could benefit if you want to be part of the e-Estonia. Um, one of it is uh, e-residency, uh, if you want to experience some of the digital services Estonians get. And the other is digital nomad visa, uh, if you want to keep working in your company abroad, but would like to physically come and chill in Estonia. I won't go into detail with either of them, other than say that even though Estonian population barely passes 1 million, with stuff like e-residency, um, we can make Estonia 10 million, 20 million people society. So for its citizens, Estonia is a country without borders. It's a global country. And all that is thanks to some cool technology and human cooperation. And um, I'll welcome any questions in the Q&A. Thank you very much, Andreas. That was excellent. Um, so. We're, as I say, we're going to be taking questions for the Q&A at the end, but please keep them rolling in. I see a couple have come in already. And the Mima has complimented you for being an incredibly talented speaker, which is <laughs> like, bravo, the Mima. I, I, am, I wish I was you. Uh, I am deeply envious of your skill. Um, but yes, thank you very much again, Andreas, uh, for a very interesting talk of Pinky Purple Galaxy points out. Um, and the last talk we have of the evening is Dr. Dennis Nicole. Um, so Dr. Nicole is going to be talking to us about passwords. Um, he is a reader in electronic engineering at the University of Southampton and is the co-lead for outreach programs in the Academic Center of Excellence in Cybersecurity Education and has numerous other qualifications. He's going to be talking to us about passwords, choosing them, cracking them, and avoiding them. So um, I'll leave you in his capable hands. Take it away, Dennis. Thank you very much. 
And thank you very much, Andreas, for that wonderful vision of how a uh, modern state can perform. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to move to Estonia because I actually did learn COBOL back when it was a relatively young language. And uh, it seems it's been banned in Estonia now. So uh, I'll have to stay here in the UK and deal with a lot of our legacy infrastructure. And I particularly want to talk about some of the general issues that we need to keep track of today if we're going to be working uh, um, on the on the web and through our through our devices. So I'll start off with a nice old story from the 1960s. Some of you may have seen uh, Stanley Kubrick's um, Doctor Strangelove um, movie about uh, how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. In Doctor Strangelove, the um, head of a uh, U.S. Air Force base goes slightly uh, mad and uh, dispatches the wing to go and bomb Russia. And he sets a password on all of their radios so they can't be recalled, even by the president of the United States, um, unless the magic three letter password is known. And much of the movie revolves around trying to guess or cajole or extract the password in order to call back uh, the bombers. And at the end, Slim Pickens um, rides down successfully on his bomb um, to uh, <clears throat> unfortunately accidentally end the world. At exactly the same time um, that uh, Dr. Strangelove was being uh, put on our movie screens, it turns out that uh, President Kennedy issued a presidential finding. He was worried that the nuclear weapons in the U.S. arsenal would indeed fall into the wrong hands. And he issued a finding insisting that all nuclear weapons be equipped with a password. And if you didn't know the password, you couldn't detonate the bomb. And so the general dutifully equipped every bomb um, every bomb with an eight digit password and the generals dutifully then set that eight digit password for every bomb in the entire US strategic arsenal to zero 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 because of course what uh, generals fear most is not having readiness they don't want to miss the war if the Russians attack we don't want not knowing the password to mean we can't shoot back and do the job we're being paid to do so uh, that was it for uh, Many years, um, every U.S. nuclear weapon had the, uh, the the eight zeros password. I guess uh, eight being a lucky number in China, Chinese nuclear weapons probably come with eight eights as uh, passwords. If you want to see all the rest of the story, um, Eric Schloss has written quite a good book, which you could get hold of and uh, and find out all the other near misses that we evaded through the 50s and 60s and 70s before we made our nuclear stockpiles relatively safe against accidents. Chip and pin is a good example of a not very sensible passwording mechanism. We set a four digit pin on our credit on our credit cards and on our payment cards. The idea is that that's something that the customers can be expected to remember, although some nevertheless still write it down. Um, and if you made it any longer, you wouldn't be able to do business. Even though it's trivially easy for someone soldier surfing in the supermarket or looking over your shoulder at the ATM to grab the uh, four digit pin. We've stuck with four digit pins for many years and we've achieved that bad compromise in which still some customers feel obliged to write it down. And yet anybody, pretty much anybody um, watching over a shoulder uh, can capture it. It also turns out that an awful lot of people use some combination of their year, month or day of birth as their four digit pin. Um, so if you steal someone's wallet and you get their date of birth on their ID as well as their credit cards, you've got some pretty good guesses. If they've got four credit cards, you get four guesses on each credit card. Uh, 16 goes is quite enough on average for you to get a 50 50 chance of hitting the jackpot. So that's a really pretty inadequate passwording system. Pretty much the only value of the pin is that if you ever make the mistake of writing it down um, and admit it to the bank when you're later robbed, um, the bank will deny your response, apparently will deny your responsibility and you'll be left to carry the losses because you violated the terms of service. Not great. The National Cybersecurity Center is a part of GCHQ, GCHQ are the descendants of the Bletchley Park 
Bletchley Park code breakers, um, and uh, they, they occupy that large donut in Cheltenham. The NCSC is a branch of GCHQ that operates out of some rather nice offices um, near Victoria Station. And they're the national authority of cybersecurity in the UK. And they have six key bits of advice for normal consumers and the use of their systems. First of all, strong and separate password for your email. Your email account tends to be the key to allow you to reset passwords and manipulate all your other accounts. So you need to be sure that your email account doesn't leak through some other insecure system that gives up its password. Strong and separate password for your email. Good choice, three random words. Genuinely random, not quick brown fox. Um, but um, three genuinely random words. That's about as complex a password as you can remember and about as hard as possible for, realistically possible, for the um, automated cracking systems to break into. Possible, but relatively hard. For all the other accounts, save your passwords in a password manager. There's one built into most web browsers. It's not 100% secure, but it's much better than sharing the same password between many different accounts. Another reasonable choice, if the terms of service allow it, is just to write them down and keep them um, secured away at home, because most of your attackers will be on the web. Unless you hold your passwords up in front of your webcam, they're not going to get them. Be careful, though, that you don't violate the terms of service. Turn on two-factor authentication. We'll discuss that later. Really, really critical, keep everything updated. Your Windows machines, all the software on your Windows machines, particularly if you have things like Adobe Acrobat, you shouldn't have Adobe Flash, that's now out of date. Um, but it, a lot of the big commercial software um, is quite vulnerable to errors. And in particular, once the patches have been published, all the bad guys can look inside the patch and see the vulnerability. So it's a race for you to apply the patch before the bad guys um, use the information in the patch to attack your computer. We've long passed the days when major organizations can hold patches while they check to make sure that the patch doesn't break any of their key commercial applications. When you get an official patch, you've got to apply it. If your application breaks, too bad. Because if you didn't apply it, the bad guy would own your system and, and a broken application would be the least of your problems. And finally, back up your data. Um, and an on offline thing, this is my five terabyte um, USB drive. I back things up onto that periodically and keep it disconnected from all my other machines. So if the worst happens, I can get my stuff back. Most of the sorts of attacks you get, well, if you let your Windows machine out of your control, people will be able to steal your password, whether it's turned on or turned off. Anyone with a basic, um, we call it script kitty, but you know, enthusiastic A-level student ability at hackery will be able to get hold of your password hash and they'll be able to turn that password hash back into a password and they'll own your machine. Shoulder surfing is a problem, particularly with four digit chip and pin. A lot of what goes on is that a big file of, of obscured or we call it hashed passwords from a server will be grabbed maybe a million of them, and then over time they're cracked by the bad guys, and the bad guys then use those cracked cards to try other accounts with the same username on other systems. So if they were to get into, for example, Twitter, which they haven't, as far as I know, they could use your Twitter password against your Twitter account name to try to get you get into banks. Um, a classic example of this happened with the um, adultery site Ashley Madison, in which they had a very secure mechanism for protecting most of their passwords. Um, but unfortunately, they had another area of the site with a weaker password strategy. Those passwords were stolen and cracked. And then those cracked passwords were used against the secure part of the site. That caused a lot of people a lot of personal difficulty. With Windows passwords, though, you don't even need to crack them. You can just buy what are called rainbow tables. So for 2,400 US dollars, you can get a table containing the reversing the hashes of every password of up to 10 lowercase letters or digits. That's really pretty bad. Um, the top row there are called LM hashes. Those are very weak legacy Windows hashes. But the um, hashes from further down, the NTLM ones, are the ones on, used on current versions of Windows 10. Um, if you know about salts, Windows does not salt passwords. So the hash 
um, every every password is associated with a single hash. More sophisticated systems like Apple systems will often make um, use a sorting technique, which um, makes rainbow tables less useful. I mentioned two factor authentication. Um, a lot of modern two factor authentication involves SMS messages or typing um, into the DTMF um, pad on your phone or receiving a voice message on the phone and typing it into the computer. Those are probably the worst sort of two factor authentication you can have because it's depressingly easy to not just to steal a physical phone, but also to steal a phone account. It's called a SIM cloning attack. And basically, the bad guy just phones up your uh, SIM provider and tells a sob story about the dog has eaten your SIM. And by the way, I've moved at the same time. And quite a lot of providers will send a replacement SIM to a different address and allow you to allow the bad guy to capture your phone. Similar sorts of things can happen on landlines, particularly VoIP landlines. An app on a secure phone can be a pretty good approach. I'm not wildly convinced about the security of Android phones, which are all I can afford. But if you're in the uh, iPhone demographic, there's pretty good stuff for iPhones. Um, what I use is a dedicated secure token called a YubiKey. Um, most reasonably sophisticated systems will let you use one. Um, it works the same as that Estonian ID card, except that it plugs into a uh, physical port on your PC, it's just a USB stick. Um, you don't need a special reader um, or a near field reader, which you'd need for the, uh, for the other cards. And that's a very, very popular cartoon about why the password policies that are imposed on you by lots of organizations got to use a digit, got to use an uppercase number, got to use some funny character, are just silly. Um, this is a, this problem with this kind of, um, Leet speak um, password is now pretty public and um, the uh, SKCD comic about it really pretty much captures the problem. Um, it's hard for you to remember, but it's easy for the computer to guess a unused password because all they have to do is swap every lowercase o with an uppercase o or a zero. That only makes for three times as many choices, whereas having an extra digit while having an extra word makes for 11,000 times as many choices. Much easier to use words, much better to use words, but don't use horse battery staple because people have already tried that quite a lot. And as with everybody else, I'll be more than happy to answer questions um, in the uh, chat show uh, session. Uh, if anyone wants to ask me questions about Taiwani national ID cards, which are rather like Estonia car Estonian cards, but had an unfortunate defect, feel free to ask. Thank you very much, Dennis. That was an amazing talk. Um, Three very good talks from our three speakers. Uh, if I was in the pub, I'd ask everyone to give them a big hand. So I'm imagining that all of you are just clapping frantically at home. Clap more, clap more, stop, clap again, stop, stop. Excellent stuff. So now we have the Q&A. So I'm going to invite all three speakers to come back onto the screen in some sort of a grid formation. And we're going to pitch some questions to each of them. Um, so let's start uh, with Chris. Um, and this is a question for Christine. Um, for AI to process and interpret sounds like humans, do you think they need to mimic our brain architectures? Or can that be done in principle quite differently? Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. So I think um, it is very important that we actually inform the way in which we design our algorithms by the way in which humans think and perceive the world around us. Um, this has two reasons that I say that. Uh, on one hand, um, prior knowledge about human cognition may allow us to design, for example, human-inspired architectures of neural networks for deep learning uh, that actually uh, incorporate features that we perceive as intuitive. And they will hopefully allow us also to design better algorithms that achieve performance in terms of decision making uh, that we may not be able to achieve without actually accounting for um, our prior knowledge in terms of the human design. And then there's also uh, the aspect of interpretability. 
um, if we can investigate correlations between uh, cues that humans perceive as salient and cues that machines actually automatically learn and decide are salient, um, the hope is that that will lead to interpretable decision making, ultimately will allow us to design explainer systems that actually lead to explainable decision making where end users can access in an intuitive way why a machine has made a decision and ultimately it will ensure that AI technologies are actually trustworthy. Thank you very much for a very thorough answer. Um, and we have a question for Andreas. Um, has there been any, been any resistance to e-Estonia from older Estonians? So Andrew says that as an older man himself, he finds his automatic responses to be deeply suspicious. Like, is that something that's happening in Estonia? And if it is, how is Estonia dealing with that? Yeah, um, I mean, for sure, anything new is um, scary. And and one thing that we've been lucky with that people generally have quite high trust um, towards the government. But in terms of like adopting the user first hand, it's, you know, actually the Estonian ID card is almost like a duplicate of the Finnish ID card. And literally the only difference was that um, we in Estonia, we made the ID card mandatory. So people had to use it. And to be honest, many think that this was kind of like the make it decision because Finnish um, ID cards and the whole system is non-compulsory um, and it did not see uh, mass adoption. But I mean, the ID card was introduced in 2002. So that's almost like 20 years. Um, and people have, you know, used that time to get used to it. And many mistakes that have been made or could have been made are fixed. And the ecosystem around the whole um, uh, thing is kind of like matured now. Um, and I think this definitely helps. Thank you very much. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so we have a question uh, for Dennis. Um, given that you highlighted physical accents access and shoulder surfing as two of the primary theft media. Do you expect that fewer hacks occurred during lockdown when everyone was isolated? And and was that something like, has there been any research to kind of look at that? I think physical access tends to show up um, mainly, I think, in educational settings would be my interpretation. It's situations where people who might be up to mischief or at least you don't necessarily altogether trust um, are in shared spaces with relatively poor physical security of kit, um, maybe hospitals, places like that. Um, and shoulder surfing is an important example, I think, but it's not really a cyber security example at all um, because it really pretty much predates the cyber stuff. And it pretty much, it, I think it pretty much only applies to, to chip and pin. Um, and there are quite a few other potential hazards with chip and pin anyway. I think we're going to have to move away from that pretty quickly. Um, the three digit um, CVV2, as it's called, that little number printed on the back by the signature stripe, is also a pretty hopelessly poor security mechanism. Because if you ever hand your card to someone, which you used to have to do every time when it went through the physical machine, and you still often do when they're swiping it, they can easily capture that three digit CVV2. Um, and that in particular um, gives an opportunity for online crime. Um, usually you can buy things over the web if you've got hold of the um, numbers on the front of the card, which everyone can see, um, the CVV2 on the back of the card, which very often can be seen as well. Um, and you're able to arrange the delivery to be at the authorised address of the owner. And that's usually pretty easy to fake up. There's quite a lot of ways yeah. of creating no, it's, it's, it's um I had my credit card details stolen once and it was an unhappy experience. Yeah. So yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um I bought a vacuum cleaner for five hundred pounds. I didn't know I wanted one. Um I used to get yeah. hotel rooms in Singapore. <laughs> ah, um and I think we have a few other questions for other speakers, which I think are going to magically appear on the screen. Um, so we have a question for Christine. Are you talking about machine learning or are you talking about specific intervention from programmers to teach sound and identity links? Or is it a mixture of the two? Great question. Uh, both. Um, basically, ultimately, 
Audio is highly sequential, so uh, it heavily depends on the context. It very much depends on the environment that you're in, what you're trying to say, who's saying it, where they're standing, and so on and so forth. And audio arrives in a sequential online manner. Um, so in order to actually allow machines to make sense of that, what we need are algorithms that perceive in an online way and make decisions in an online way. Um, and because it's not possible to necessarily, um, well, it's not possible to collect large enough data sets to actually capture any possible setup that you require uh, without creating imbalances in the data sets, um, what we ultimately need are self-supervised algorithms where machines can actually learn on the fly without human annotation and labeling uh, and can also learn through their own experiences. Uh, of course, on the flip side, we also have an enormous amount of prior information from our own experience as human listeners, uh, and we can and we should incorporate this in some form of supervised or semi-supervised manner, uh, but ultimately this drives us towards something uh, that is experiential learning. Thank you very much. Um... I will just say that the memer has said in the chat, someone bought a vacuum cleaner with your card. That sucks, which is amazing. Um, but thank you for the great answer to the question, Christine. That was super interesting. Um, and we have a question for um, Dennis. Are end-to-end -end encrypted communication apps with no backdoors a good thing, and that's in capitals, for society? Also, what do you think about anonymized money transfers through cryptocurrency? And I think Andreas might be able to feed back on that last question as well, because you mentioned blockchain. Yeah, um, I think we've, we've had some efforts in the US and some efforts in the UK by government to come up with some sensible way that essentially allows the government to spy on you, but not anybody else. Um, and broadly speaking, those things seem not to work well. Uh, pretty much every effort that's been made to create what the NSA used to call a nobody but us capability has gone horribly wrong, um, typically because um, bad guys gained access to the capability. Um, if for no other reason than that all big organizations have problems with um, individual with, with, with the security of their employees, I mean, the insider threat is always a problem. Um, and it's pretty, it's so on the whole, I think we probably want to go for retaining decently encrypted applications. But Fair enough. it's not as easy as you might think. Um, and um, I don't know of many um, applications that don't realistically have backdoors, effectively, because you, you can, if you're determined, you can almost always attack the endpoints. There's usually yes, someone yes. getting at the data before it's been encrypted. Uh, at yeah, the end. Yes. That makes a lot of that makes a lot of sense. Thank you, um, Andreas. Do you have any thoughts on on anonymity through cryptocurrency and like whether or not that's like a societal good or a societal bad? Yeah, I mean, in general, I'm I'm quite quite an optimist um, in terms of everything that is uh, to do with um, cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology. Like, I think you know, there's. There, there, there's some. It's, it's, there's a stage where where the technology is at right now. You know where it's about um, anonymous transfers. But what I've been keeping an eye on recently, what what is a curious concept, is that uh, we've heard quite a few central banks starting their own cryptocurrency projects. And I feel like projects like that have the most um, uh, potential to to actually feasibly come to life uh, in terms of uh, crypto payments made. I mean, they could. Uh, to some extent, like completely bypass the commercial banks that we have. And uh, that's an interesting future to think about. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've probably got time for a couple more questions. And um, we have a question for Christine. Um, would you favor robots talking to each other without humans comprehending their dialogue? Uh, no, I would not. Um, the reason I say that is that Ultimately, what we want to achieve are trustworthy robotics. Uh, for humans, it is, at least in my mind and my opinion, uh, questionable which application would warrant where we cannot understand what a machine is basing their decisions on and what dialogue they're basing their, their decisions on. And the reason that I say that is if machines can in some way converse that is not interpretable to humans, 
it is impossible for us to regulate that data. And in order to ensure that decisions are unbiased and are safe and are trustworthy, we need to regulate data and we need to put in place the appropriate mechanisms to do so. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, we have another question from Andrew, um, a question for everyone. Can you think of ways that the poison of pseudoscience can be tackled? People can make very poor decisions based on astrology, anti-vaccine stances, poison in the water. Uh, that might be a Taskmaster reference, uh, etc. Um, I'll let uh, if I ask Christine and then Andreas and then Dennis to tackle. So, Christine, do you have any thoughts on this? It's yeah, quite I think a this is question. It's quite a broad question. I think this uh, ties up with a lot of the um, aspects that the Trustworthy Autonomous Systems Hub is trying to address. Uh, ultimately, when it comes to automated decision making, uh, we need to uh, consider that there are ways in which machines may be misinformed. And this may be either bias through data or it may be bias that is inadvertently introduced in the algorithms through programmers. Or it may be adversarial attacks uh, where humans purposefully try to poison the data. Um, in order to make sure that we can trust those decisions, uh, we are investigating this as part of, of a whole hub. And this is a, a major strategic investment uh, by the UK government, um, which consists of, a, uh, of the TAS hub, as well as several nodes that consider aspects uh, of what makes autonomous systems trustworthy, and particularly data poisoning is one of the aspects that we consider as part of that. Thank you. Um, Andreas, any thoughts on this one? Yeah, I mean, I would I would have like, a, you know, a more human approach. Um, I think I think it's it's about education mm -hmm. uh, to bring you like an example. Uh, the, the first step Estonia did for digital uh, digitalization after um, gaining independence from the Soviet Union, um, they brought computers to every classroom. Um, and that was in the early 90s. Um, so and, and, and that's generation that that um, grew up on this pilot program of bringing computers to every school they became um, tech driven they became knowledgeable people uh, knowledgeable people they um, they um, knew how to argument and gather all the information necessary they're kind of like entrepreneurs like the estonians behind building skype or or many people in the in the uk might know starships like those uh, six wheel delivery robots and also Estonians behind that or the international money transfer company like WISE. And I mean, all these, I mean, these are just like entrepreneurial success stories, but I feel like that's all um, uh, because we started with education first. Very good answer, I think. Um, Dennis, do you have anything? To yeah, I'd agree that? very much with Andreas. The danger in many societies is that the educational system is being is taken over and controlled for religious or political goals. I mean, we have we're having some of those troubles in the UK already to well have done since the 1980s, and it's much much worse in, of course, some other countries with 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 dominant narrow-minded religions, or um, or with over influential narrow-minded religions, um, and and we've just got to get a grip on an indi on believing in an independent um, education system that, that can operate outside religious and political frameworks and and teach fair honest stuff to the kids i think i think like um obviously there are places in the world that have more difficulties with that and places in the world that have less i think in general uh, the uk is is doing not so badly on those sorts of fronts um, but I think it's a very good point that kind of um, state interference, whatever the motivation uh, in academia and in knowledge is like potentially a huge problem. Um, so thank you very much uh, for that. And unfortunately, although I can see that there are many more questions in the chat that have not been answered, um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Not only because it is nine o'clock, uh, but I have finished my beer. So thank you all very much for attending. Um, I've been tweeting under hashtag point 21, and I'm sure some of our speakers will be doing that as well if they are on the Twitters. Um, I'm getting some head shakes and some nods, so that's fine uh, and dandy. Um, but thank you all very much for attending. Thank you, uh, the speakers, all very much for speaking and giving such wonderful talks and answers to questions. And um, with that, we will um, say goodbye, and we will see you tomorrow at 8 p.m. for the next Point of Science from the University of Southampton.
Thank you very much indeed.